The Steelers made a few moves this week, one letting go of cornerback Akella Witherspoon and also extending quarterback Mitch Trubisky on top of bringing back Mason Rudolph. But what does it all mean? Is Omar Khan planning something? We'll talk about that, where not only what it impacts to those groups and position, those position groups, but also what it might do for the Steelers' salary cap as far as moves ahead and where the money might be going. All that and more here on the North Shore Drive podcast. We also got Bucko's talk here. It's going to be a fun episode. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive Podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Here, as you see with me, is Brian Batko, one of our esteemed Steelers beat reporters. We're going to get to some Steelers talk in a bit. And remember, you can always find this show on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on your favorite podcasting app and definitely on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoyed on YouTube. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily uh, episodes that come from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. While we're just Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have tons of content, including a Paul's Ice episode that just came out yesterday. You should check that out if you haven't already. But... Chris, I was getting lunch the other day, and I ran into a guy who uh, recognized me from the YouTube shows and said he enjoys watching. So you love when that happens out in the wild. We're 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 popular, baby. We're celebrities, Brian. We got shout out to Matt. Absolutely, we got. Uh, we you, did you give him an autograph or anything like that? Uh, no, I don't think he. Uh, I don't think he needed that, but he still had some nice things to say. So, uh, if you're watching Matt up in McCandless, appreciate the viewership. Appreciate the love from, from Matt and everyone else who enjoys the show. But let's get into some of the things that happened here uh, with, with the Steelers this week. Uh, they let go of a Keller Witherspoon, so he's gone from the cornerback cornerback room. Uh, we'll talk about Mitch Trubisky in a second. But Brian, what do you see being the impact of a Keller being gone? Him and Levi Wallace kind of had almost identical contract situations numbers-wise with the Steelers. And what do you think this means for all the rest of the guys that are still in the, on the cornerback list? Yeah, I mean, I think when the Steelers signed those two guys to uh, those two-year, $8 million deals, similar players and obviously got the same same cash flow and, and term on their contracts, it kind of shaped up to me as a situation of like, whoever plays better for us in 2022 will be the guy who's here in 2023. The other one might have to look elsewhere for employment. And that's that's ultimately what happened with Witherspoon. And, and he really just had a lost season, you know, got hurt actually first played poorly, then got hurt, came back, played poorly again. And, you know, then you never really heard from him. So I think it was pretty clear that the Steelers were going to move on. It was just a matter of, of when, not if. And, you know, you look at all the the moves they made in the cornerback group this off season, signing Patrick Peterson, who's much more of a true outside corner to replace Cam Sutton, you know, bringing back James Pierre, drafting the two uh, young, long outside guys, Joey Porter Jr. Mm-hmm. and Corey Trice, who uh, play the position in a similar way to Witherspoon. So uh, that's just, you know, he was caught in the numbers game. He's he's the odd man out. Um, we'll see if he latches on anywhere else. But clearly the Steelers weren't uh, feeling real uh, invested in him last year when they made that trade for William Jackson the third, even at the deadline. And he never even played a down. Uh, but still, even with that, Witherspoon never played again. So um, just, you know, it was a, a short stint for him in Pittsburgh overall. He had some decent moments, but they're, they're going to go in a different direction now. And I think people might be sleeping a little bit on Levi Wallace. I know he's kind of forgotten man a little bit now with Patrick Peterson and Joey Porter Jr. in the mix. And perhaps he won't be a starter uh, for most of this season. But if he is, I think you can do a lot worse than him as your uh, your CB2. Absolutely. I mean, he was kind of he kind of came up in some big moments for the Steelers last year in coverage. He was not this uh, extreme li- liability. Um, when you go back and you look at it, he was the most targeted cornerback tied with Cam- Cameron Sutton last year, but it only allowed 54.9 percent of his receptions. Um, he, uh, he, picks off had, he makes plays on the ball. He makes plays on the ball. He had six breakups, four interceptions. I mean, Solid year from from Levi from from Levi Wallace, especially from a number two guy. Did give up three touchdowns, but I, I look at that and I say, hey, that's solid. So you're right. Even if Joey Porter Jr. isn't ready, like right away, they have a guy who is an NFL veteran who had success with them last year um, and can kind of hold down the fort next to Patrick Peterson. Now, granted, 
neither of those guys are fast anymore. And I think that's the big thing there is that you look at their speed and that could, that could be a problem, but I think both of them being veteran who kind of base themselves in their technique, that could be solid here, but let's, let's switch real quick to Mitch Trubisky getting the extension. We also know Mason Rudolph is, is, is coming back here, giving the Steelers the same quarterback room. Some people out there, Brian, more what we're arguing, Hey, let go of Mitch because he would give you $8 million in cap space. And it'd be an easy way to free things up. How do you see this being a beneficial part for the Steelers? Or do you see, think this was a mistake on their part to extend him beyond the, where his contract already was? Well, I, I think it's hard to say without knowing uh, exactly how this is going to get broken up contract wise, but we can safely assume it's going to give them some cap relief in the short term, the way they've always done it uh, with, with Kevin Colbert or Omar Khan at the helm is, you kind of kick the can down the road uh, and, and you try to make yourself as good as you can be in every individual season. And, you know, you worry about the ramifications of kind of charging some of those deals to your credit card, if you will. Uh, but oftentimes the salary cap increases year over year. And, you know, you're never really left uh, holding the bag for too long. Um, you know, the pandemic season that kind of backfired on the Steelers. They were really up against it cap wise and they lost some good players that year, but who could have foreseen uh, COVID-19 coming and, and the ramifications that would have. So this is kind of par for the course for them. And I'm just surprised that Trubisky was willing to do it. Uh, maybe we all sort of misread his situation in that, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be 29, I believe in August. So, I mean, on one hand, you think this is somebody who he never really got much of a chance after things went south in Chicago. I mean, he had a few yeah. weeks here with the Steelers, but you know they pulled the plug at halftime of that Jets game, and I was one of the people at that time who didn't necessarily think he he needed to be benched 100% for Kenny Pickett, but that's the move that Mike Tomlin made, and he wasn't going to uh, put that jello back in the box. So now he's Drew Bisky's right back to you know kind of being that number two in, in the role he was in in Buffalo. So. Uh, but what I'm saying is, you know, he can't he can't be inside of his head, but maybe he's just at a point now in his career where he thinks, look, the long term stability for me and my family in a city that's two hours away from where I grew up is a little bit more of a priority than trying to chase the QB one job in Tampa or Atlanta or any of these other cities who uh, have somebody less entrenched at that position than the first quarterback taken in the draft a year ago. I hear you on that. And uh, I, I just, you know, one, I think it's it's kind of interesting, you know, think, thinking about, you know, the life of guys who seek that QB one jobs, but there's good money to be made from backup quarterbacks. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it, you can, you can make millions of dollars and get really paid really well to sit on the bench, be available. And then, uh, and just come up in big moments for your, for your team. I mean, heck Byron Leftwich and Charlie Batch did that for quite some time. Uh, for for the Steelers here in Pittsburgh, uh, back with Ben Roethlisberger was quarterback. So you wonder about that there. Also, I just noticed you're a Jello in the box guy and not a toothpaste in the tube guy. That's an. I'm just guy. using the Tomlinism that he walked <laughs> out on us like three years ago that I'd never heard before, um, and I still I don't really it. understand it, which is why I love it. I've heard toothpaste back in the tube, but when he talked about putting Jello back in the box, it's like you mean the powdered stuff that makes yeah, like, Jello, I, or like the actual gelatin. Uh, Never did get a clarification on that. Yeah, very, very confusing there because the Jello that I normally it came out of like a like one of those pudding cups or whatever. So like, right? Yeah, it would be Jello back like? in the uh, container or or bowl, I guess. But um, either way, I mean, you don't really want to you don't want to work too much with your with your Jello. I think that's that's kind of his <laughs> his bottom line on on that is it's an untenable situation once it's once it's out. Well, the question will be, is it an untenable situation with the Steelers' salary cap as far as filling in some other play players here that could complete this roster? I want to talk with you about possibilities. We know they brought back and brought in Quan Alexander. We talked about that earlier this week, but let's revisit that as well as what they could be doing with the money right here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the North Shore Drive podcast. Chris Carter, Brian Batko, breaking things down in your Pittsburgh Steelers here. Brian, we don't know the official contract numbers of Mitch Trubisky just yet. So we do know that it's, it's, a, it's an extension right now. And again, presumably that some of his, his some of his uh, salary cap hit is going to be moved down the line. Like you said, kicking that can down the road. We do know that uh, Kella Witherspoon approximately was like $4 million freed up there. So 
in the projections right now for for where the Steelers have salary cap space, um, you kind of you kind of look at their situation. You think, okay, they they should have somewhere where between like ten to twelve million dollars in in cap space, um, but they still need to sign their rookies, and that's going to still cost you a pretty penny here. Are the Steelers able to make some moves here? Do you think, or is there are they just kind of just setting themselves up so that eventually, when all said and done, they're they can have a cushion that they normally like to have that's like eight to ten million dollars. Yeah, I lean toward thinking they're just giving themselves that cushion, and and nobody ever takes into account, you know, there there could be injuries that force you to go out there and spend money to mm-hmm. sign a guy. You know, you certainly knock on wood and hope nobody's going to get hurt in OTAs or or mini camp. But obviously, once training camp preseason ball rolls around, uh, anything can happen. It's it's a brutal game in that sense. So um, I I just don't think that this is priming the pump for any major move. You know, there's not many moves out there to be made as as I look down the list of, you know, best available free agents right now in the NFL. I mean, I think number one, what's the old saying? You know, these guys are available for a reason when it's May mm-hmm. 19th or whatever it is now. Um, but also the, with the look at the Steelers depth chart, I mean, there's nowhere that I think they're they're really, uh, you know, glaringly weak. I mean, I think there are some areas where the depth is questionable, um, but any kind of signing that you'd be earmarking money for um you know this in this sense you know you'd probably want to use that on a player who uh is going to be more than just depth i mean we always talk about that third outside linebacker spot sure it'd be great to have four premier edge rushers but it's just never going to work out that well i don't think unless you find somebody who unlike melvin ingram a few years ago is really keen on the idea of being a rotational pass rusher and playing 10 to 15, maybe 20 snaps a game if, if everybody's mm-hmm. healthy. So uh, I think there's also something to be said for just using your money wisely and having that kind of nest egg if you need it down the road. And if not, you roll it over and maybe that's going to help you out in the future. The other thing that I, you know, is kind of flying under the radar a little bit, I would say going into OTAs is just Alex Highsmith and uh, what's going to go on with his extension. Uh, could you, put yourself in a position where you actually pay him a little bit more up front and give yourself some flexibility down the road and, and maybe save uh, over the long term of the contract. You know, I feel like they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't want to see him be the type of player who gets lost in the shuffle. I think they'd want to bring him back and keep him around uh, as that bookend to TJ Watt, but you're going to need to shell out some money to do it. No, I'm, I'm, I, I, I agree with, you know, having that protection there. And Alex Highsmith needs to be a priority. You know, we're talking about, you know, their depth at edge rusher. If Alex Highsmith were to go after after this season, there would be a chasm there. They would need to make some serious moves in the offseason. And Alex Highsmith, A, seems like a great teammate. There's never a complaint. He's just been the the quiet, hard worker that's just stepped up when you've needed him to. Had double-digit sacks. He's been your own product. Mike Tomlin talked to us before. In fact, when, you know, talking about the Melvin Ingram situation, he was like, this is kind of why we prefer – to make most of our guys, guys that we develop here, because we know them, we have that relationship with them. And there's less questions as far as when there's discrepancies in playing time, there's more, there's more of that relationship there. And Alex Highsmith, I think right now he's forming into his prime and yes, he might cost you a pretty penny. I think that he's, you know, when you look at his potential and his size and his, his youth, I think some teams are going to look out there and probably say, Hey man, we'll, we'll be able to pay you in the tens of millions here. Uh, you know, for over uh, over a several year deal. I'm not sure if he'd get a Bud Dupree deal that like like Bud got from Tennessee, but he might get a deal at, at somewhere else that'd be expensive. And so the Steelers have to ask a question: How do they want to try to keep him? Because I think if you make put him pair him with T.J. Watt over the next three to four years, you have the potential to have the best pass rushing ed, edge rushing duo duo in the NFL with the the potential you've seen in him, and also T.J. Watt if he's able to stay healthy and get back to where he's been. That, that, you know that 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 duo can be dangerous. We've seen them be dangerous there, so I do agree that's a priority. Um, We've also seen them handle these extensions in different ways too. I mean, a couple of years yeah. ago, as we recall, T.J. Watt went right up to you know right before uh, week one, a, a few days before. So, and he didn't do uh, anything uh, in team drills in camp, and that became a whole sideshow uh, that year. You know, Keith Butler, uh, then defensive coordinator, was opining on it. Uh, Watt was, uh, you know trying to look busy, I think, uh, on the side field mm-hmm. when really he's just waiting for his money. Uh, but then last year with Minka Fitzpatrick, 
they get it done in June, I think it was. And, you know, you have him uh, involved with everything in training camp. And, and Deontay Johnson was another one who uh, stayed away for the most part from OTAs. And I, I'll just be curious to see how does Alex Highsmith approach it as, you know, does he follow in the footsteps of those guys and just kind of take it easy? Obviously, OTAs are voluntary to begin with, but, you know, the mandatory mini camp uh, next month. Will he participate fully or will he say, hey, I think I'm on the brink of an extension, same way Deontay Johnson was, same way Mika Fitzpatrick was, same way TJ Watt was. Uh, I'm just going to kind of chill here. And when you guys are ready to, uh, you know, to go to the table with a deal, uh, then I'll get back out there with the uh, the other teammates and get involved in some 11 and on 11 work and put my body on the line a bit more. I, 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 okay, I hear you on that. The Steelers right now, um, as it's slated on overthecap.com, have the fifth most expensive defense in the NFL. They had the, the most expensive defense last year. But that's not to say that they are still aren't spending on defense. Uh, in a way, they're spending uh, uh, right now, it's slated to be $117 million. Uh, but just that there's teams like the Bills, the Jets, the Chargers, and the Dolphins who are spending significantly more uh, in, in those spots there. If you're paying Alex Highsmith that, you're probably going to jump back up into that top territory. But they've also invest, been investing in the draft on offense. Najee Harris, Kenny Pickett, Pat Fryermuth, George Pickens, Darnell Washington now, Broderick Jones now. Guys that will be on rookie contracts that you can kind of control for a bit who I think are going to be the pillar players on, on, on offense here. Is signing Alex Highsmith going to put them on a path where they're going to have some tough decisions to make down the road? Or do you think this is just – this is fine for where they are right now. And that's not a problem that they need to necessarily worry about as they're just trying to keep constructing the nucleus that they've got. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, you, you want to balance out your, your payroll to some extent. You don't want to have that top heavy unit on one side of the ball and your pinching pennies on the other, but I, I wouldn't worry about it so much now because I think at that point, you know, that'd be a good problem to have if, if you mm. feel like you don't have uh, the, the cap space to, to, retain a bunch of talented players on offense. I think the Steelers offense and the lack of production from them in 2022, uh, you just want to see these guys progress and develop and yeah. take that next step to where you want, where you want to uh, try to figure out how to give them second contracts here in Pittsburgh. Because right now I think the bigger issue is just, are these players good enough? Is this offense going to be good enough? Uh, how do you know, where are we going to see the biggest growth? among that young nucleus that right now, like you said, Chris, you know, your, your investment in them are those draft picks. Whereas on defense, your investments have now become the actual money in cash spent right. on keeping these players. And, you know, with everything that comes with that, the risk of falling off uh, in terms of your, your production performance, health, you know, we know TJ Watt had the health issues last year. So that's kind of a different conversation. And for me, I wouldn't worry about that just yet. You know, with Kenny Pickett, uh, you've got the fifth year option. Uh, with Najee Harris, you've got the fifth year option. Um, you know, you, you need to see more out of both those guys still, I think, and to some extent. You know, they've got some things to prove in 2023 as the focal points of this offense. And, you know, if, if it comes down to where uh, all those players are, are making making it difficult on you to keep them all, then that probably means that you had some good success uh, during that run. I agree with that with that assessment. Um, another comparison to make here as far as spending wise last year, while the Steelers did have the most expensive defense in the NFL, they had by far the least expensive offense. They only spent fifty two point five million dollars on offense. The next closest was the Bengals at eighty seven million uh, or no, excuse me. Let me re let me readjust that. No, the next closest was, was the Bears at fifty six million that this thing was just not sorting correctly uh, that I'm looking at right here. But still. Spending the least there, but in 2023 that changes a little bit. They still spending 20 the th 23rd most there in the in the NFL, but now it's jumping up to 106 million, and that comes from additions like Isaac Somal Somalo, um, you know, get bringing bringing in guys there, veteran contracts getting a little bit more like James Daniels and Mason Cole. So when when I look at this, there's a better chance at least spending wise. They've now invested more on each side. And there's a little bit more of a balance. Still defensive heavy, but there's more of a balance here as far as the investment goes in the offensive side of the ball. And I think that that's partially what we're going to see this year that should give people, I think a little more uh, perspective into how this offense can be better than it was last season on top of the development aspect that you mentioned. 
Yeah, and if some of these younger players uh, take those steps that you want to see, those great leaps forward, and it looks like they are going to be the, the face of this thing and they're the ones that you want to uh, open the, you know, back up the Brinks truck for, then, then you can get out uh, from under some of the uh, older players who have already gotten theirs, right? Your Deontay Johnsons, your Mason Coles, your Chooks Okorafors, your James Daniels. Uh, if, if you decide that you do want to ultimately move in a different direction and, and pay some other guys uh, that, that big money, uh, then you can reconfigure. So I just think that, yeah, I mean, it's not typical for NFL teams to have two big money deals to uh, a couple of edge rushers on the same defense, but there just aren't many good tandems uh, as good as TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith as well. So um, I don't think that you are, uh, you know, negating your, your upward mobility on the offensive side of the ball or anything like that. Uh, if you do also decide that you give Alex Highsmith that lucrative contract extension and you know I'm well aware that at that point you know you'll have Watt, Cam Hayward, Minka Fitzpatrick, Alex Highsmith all making big time money um, and it's not not necessarily sustainable to pay everybody like that on your defense but I mean that's four guys that's that's a core that you need to build around and uh, you can go a little bit cheaper on some role players if you've got Hayward collapsing the pocket uh, every single time and Watt and Highsmith teeing off on on quarterbacks and Fitzpatrick back there in the deep third of the field, uh, just waiting to pick the pick the ball off. So uh, that that to me is just kind of what roster building comes down to, and you know that's that's the way that the Steelers are are trending in a good way because they've made some good draft picks and some good trades. We'll see how they continue that trend next week. OTA startup. Brian will be there. Ray will be there. We'll have our team there for the Post Gazette giving over things. We'll have a preview of OTAs on our Monday episode of the North Shore Drive podcast. But don't go anywhere. We got to talk about these Pirates. They've won two of their last three. Rich Hill had a really good outing. We're going to hear from Andrew Destin, who will be in the press box this upcoming weekend, to hear from what have the Pirates been doing right and how do they look heading into their series with the Diamondbacks this weekend? All that and more here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Stick with us. We'll be right back. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We switch from the Steelers to the Buccos, the Pirates. Are back in town now. They split with the Detroit Tigers, losing 4-0 in the first game, but then winning 8-0 off of a really strong performance from Rich Hill in the second game. And now they come home to two, two home series against the Diamondbacks and the Rangers, both teams with decent records who are going to prove challenges. We're going to break some things down with Andrew Destin here. He covers the Pirates along with Jason Mackey, as well as Andrew does everything. We have him here hockey sometimes. He's just, he, he, knows, he knows all the things. He's getting all the experiences. But Andrew, before we talk about the Diamondbacks what have you seen out of the last few games the Pirates lost 11 of 12 games at one point in the plummet that was basically the erasing of all the great things that they're not the erasing but kind of balancing out the great things they did in April and then they had that really rough first half of May but they've won two of their last three have you seen anything change to them is there something going on there or is this just they won a couple games but the they're still going to be struggling for a bit here I think there's some good things to take away, but I, I'll defer to your latter point that they still have some work to do. Um, mm -hmm. And to, to summarize that, I think what, what I'm trying to say is that um, the pitching, it's amazing what pitching can do for you, right? You get a great outing mm -hmm. from Rich Hill. You get, you know, a losing streak stopper in Mitch Keller who provides you with two big games. The pitching has gotten better. And it's not just those two guys. You look through some of the other starts. Um, you like what you saw from Contreras. Oviedo showed you a little bit in Baltimore. So I think, Yes, the losing streak, everybody wants to talk how bad the hitting was, which is fair. The hitting was not great. Um, but pitching can compensate for a lot of those deficiencies. And I think we saw some better overall outings from the starting rotation. Um, there was some shakiness in the bullpen. But overall, I would say that, you know, what you saw from Rich Hill, what we've been seeing from Mitch Keller, who's really been excellent all season long, and especially so he's been untouchable as of late. Those are more sustainable things that you can point to and say, hey, well, if the starting pitching is giving you a shot. You can win some of those tight ball games. The problem with that losing streak, right, was you know you're a conjunction, um, you know, untimely hitting with pitching that was giving up home runs and not lasting long in the games and forcing the bullpen into tough spots. You know that hasn't really been happening over not just these last two or three games, but you can go back all the way to the Colorado series. I mean, in Baltimore, I think the total was the or the Pirates gave up eight runs in three games. 
you know, they, they only won one of the three games, but you know, you'll take that if you're a team, you'll always take averaging less than three runs yielded per game. So I think Mm -hmm. there's still work to be done on the hitting front. There's no question about that, but over the last five games, um, you know, they, they've given up 16 runs in total. That's pretty good. I think that's fairly sustainable. And that's something you can point to and say the pitching is correcting itself, not to mention it seems like there's a good shot that Vince Velasquez could be back sooner rather than later. Um, Luis Ortiz, of course, being prompted into the rotation recently. So the pitching gives you hope. The hitting kind of still need to see a little bit more there. What do you think needs to change with the hitting? Because, you know, that was one thing that kind of worked in May was helping them get on base, and they became one of the best base running teams in all of Major League Baseball uh, for, for, for a bit there. Um, and uh, and I just I looked at that, and I was like, man, like, what happened? What changed? And they still lead all of baseball in stolen bases right now, but a lot of teams are starting to catch up. What has to change to get the bats back on track to at least just be solid enough so that they can get their base running going? Yeah, I'm pretty old school when it comes to the baseball approach here, so forgive me, uh, anybody. Who's Go ahead. <laughs> um, for me, it's just let the game come to you. I mean, it, it's great to steal bags. It's great to be athletic on the base pass, but we've seen it a few times over the last few series where it's gotten the best of the Pirates, where all of a sudden you strike them out, throw them out, and uh, where you're trying to do a hit and run, and it doesn't work for you, and all of a sudden that becomes a double play. And you're forcing hitters to do not unnatural things, but when you're trying to squeeze runs out, that's kind of a show to your batters that, hey, like we don't have full confidence in you to hit a two-run jack. Like We need you to put the ball in play and incite offense in different ways. Um, that's all well and good. I understand doing that with as athletic a team as the Pirates have. But, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about just letting guys go into the box for a couple of games and say, hey, let's figure this out and let's get back to the approach that we were doing, which was being really patient. I mean, that was something that was really helpful for them earlier in the season was drawing a lot of walks, just getting on base – and then allowing those base runners to yield runs off of home runs. I mean, we, we forget how that start of the year, how hot Brian Reynolds was, uh, how that turned over the page, and you had Connor Joe then got really hot. There was somebody who was mm-hmm. always kind of leading that charge, and right now we're still looking for that person. So until that person identifies themselves, um, you know, we're going to keep seeing the stuff where it's, hey, a hit and run with one out in the fourth inning, and what could have been a rally doesn't work out. Um, some of that stuff, statistical anomalies, right? Eventually the market will correct things like, you know, struggling with the bases loaded. That's not going to happen every single time that the Pirates are at the bat. So um, there's some things that you can point to in the last game, the 8 nothing win that gives you some optimism. But I think overall, it's just a collectively more calm approach, you know, not trying to force offense, not trying to create runs. It's May. There's still plenty of time. Let these guys, let their bats right. continue to heat up. And if we're in June or July and we're having this same conversation, then it might be the, hey, maybe these guys aren't the ones who can get it done. Maybe we need to look either outside the franchise or within the franchise, which I know a lot of people will clamor for that. So, um, But for the time being, you got to ride with these guys. They've shown you enough. They've gotten you above 500. Ride with them and don't try to make them do stuff that uh, maybe isn't inherent to who they are as baseball players. Indeed, they are still above 500. They're sitting at 23 and 20 right now, second in. In the, in, the NL, in the NL Central, which, again, if, uh, if you were to tell most Pirates fans that way back in uh, the start of the season, I think everyone would be taking that right now. They're only a game back of, of the Brewers. Uh, but let's talk about their upcoming opponent. They got the Diamondbacks com- coming to town. And this is going to be interesting because I think the Pirates, like, you know, everyone talked about how they were lucking out in the first month of first month of the schedule by playing a lot of bad teams. And that's why they were winning. And you know what? Uh, there was, there, there were reason to claim that some of the teams that they were playing didn't have good records. The Cardinals haven't been good this year. Uh, then, you know, the, the Red Sox haven't, haven't lived up to what they, what, what they were, what they usually have been there, There's, you know, there's the, there were the Reds that they were able to sweep for four games. There's a lot of things that, that happened there, but, now they're facing those teams. They got destroyed by the Rays, destroyed by the Blue Jays. They didn't win the se- They lost the series to, to the Rockies, who was a team that they uh, swept just at, at earlier in April. And now the question is, can they bounce back? What do they have to key in on with this series with the Diamondbacks? And who are some of the biggest threats that they have to be worried about? Yeah, for me, it all starts with the pitching for the Diamondbacks. You look at the three guys who are going to be going against them in Gallon, Fott, and Kelly. I mean, this is a very different Diamondbacks team, first and foremost, than we've seen from previous seasons. You know, they were rebuilding for a long time. Um, and, and it's interesting because it's probably a little bit more different of a dynamic or composition of a Diamondbacks roster than we've seen previously, where, you know, there were big bopper teams where you had guys like Goldschmidt in the middle of the lineup and it kind of played to that 
you know, that hot, dry Arizona air where it was a lot of home run hitters. Um, this is a team that can really pitch. Uh, they got some good dudes in there. I mean, Kelly was somebody who was part of, um, you know, Team USA for the World Baseball Classic. There's there's some dudes in that rotation. And not to mention, I mean, you, you can't talk about the Diamondbacks without talking about Corbin Carroll. Just such an exciting young player, uh, truly, you know, if you want to call him a four-tool or a five-tool player, whatever he is, um, you know, he's one of the young, exciting players in baseball that's worth watching out for. And I look at this as a really exciting time um, for this Diamondbacks team. On the flip side, what that means for the Pirates, um, well, th this is a team that you really have to watch out for just in the sense of what they do on the mound, what they do in that aspect. And, you know, it's going to put a lot of pressure on this uh, Pirates offense that, for the most part, um, has really struggled, you know, over the last week and a half, two weeks. So uh, this is truly, you said it, Chris, this is a litmus test for the Pirates. Um, and it doesn't get any easier against these three guys because you can make the point that uh, at least two of them, uh, some of the better pitchers, not just on the Diamondbacks, but maybe in the National League West, too. Certainly, uh, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a really big challenge for them. And then right after right after that, they get the Rangers, who also haven't been any slouches. They have the, they have the second most RBIs in all of baseball right now. So some big challenges coming up. If the Pirates bounce back, maybe it flips the flips the script here uh, on uh, on the on the Pirates May, May month of May. Here he's Andrew Destin. You'll find him in the press box with Jason Mackey this weekend, covering the, those those home stands from the Pirates. And as always, you can read all of our work at post gazettecom Andrew, thanks so much. For for joining us here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Again, I'm your host, Chris Carter. Thanks again to, for Brian Bratko as well, giving us all his insight on the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll be back Monday, getting you ready for OTAs. The Steelers are back and seeing how did the Pirates fare in their series with the Diamondbacks. All that and more. Check us out next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, here on the North Shore Drive podcast. And don't forget, we have daily content that comes out here from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette on whatever podcasting app you use and definitely on YouTube as well. Thanks again, y'all. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.